people, but the workers are few. Jesus is so worthy of our praise. Jesus' name, God is alive in me. 
How many of you guys are thankful for the name of Jesus today? This is all, all about him. Let us not forget, forget that. Even just, I've been thinking about what Jesus has done in this last weekend, even with Easter weekend, and I'm so grateful for Jesus. So grateful that he saved my life. So grateful for his grace. All power, all authority comes from Jesus' name. And, we're gonna sing this bridge again, and can we choose to focus on Jesus? It, our authority, our, our power does not come from our perfection, does not come from striving, but it comes from Jesus. He's already, he's already done the work. So let's sing this again. And God is alive in me, and the Holy Spirit inside of me, and all the authority. Come on. It's in Jesus' name, and God is alive in me inside of me is all the authority in Jesus name and God is alive in me Holy Spirit inside of me and all the authority it's in Jesus name thank you
this like we really believe it. Come on, let's sing. You are powerful. You are powerful. God above it all. I believe in you. I believe in you. You do miracles. The impossible. I believe in you. I believe in you. You are to worship with you today. So go ahead and take a second, say hello to the people around you and you can take your seat. Who's ready for chapel today? Y'all ready for chapel today? It's gonna be a great day. Y'all help me honor Olivia Sasser. Ready to go. Wow, wow, we're standing up. Let's go, come on, give it up for Olivia. Let's go. Man, that may have been her first time leading a chapel, but I think you've done this before. <laughs> That's pretty incredible, so well done today. Today is going to be an incredible chapel service. We get to talk about the topics of mental and emotional health. Thank And thank God for it. Listen, I am a huge, huge, huge proponent for counseling. I love counseling. One of the best things that's ever happened to me is Christian counseling. And all it does is just exposes the lies of the enemy, brings things that are in the dark into the light. And I love that we get to talk about this in chapel. We get to talk about it in a much different way than the world does. The world, when the, when the world talks about emotional and mental, mental health, it just gives us to, it gives the world tools on how to address the issue and teach everybody else how to walk around that issue. We get to approach it as people who have victory, people who believe in spiritual transformation. We get to t- approach it from the lens of this is my issue, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I have victory and power over that. Like this is not who I have to be, you know. So be, to bring some of that hope to us, we're gonna invite two of our doctors here uh, from Highlands College, people who have authority in this area between them. They have over 50 years of experience teaching in this arena. They've helped churches um, establish counseling, pastoral conversations at their churches. They've helped us here at Highlands College. They've helped me, I've cried to them myself. So today, uh, today we have the incredible, amazing privilege of hearing from Dr. Mike and Dr. Charity Williams. So y'all stand to your feet and help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Mike 
and Dr. Charity Williams. Jesus, give it to Jesus, come on. I just want to look at you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Charity and I are here because of you. So if anything that we say, I pray it empowers you and encourages you, not just today, but for your ministry that you'll be touching thousands and thousands of people. I would like to begin our time as it should honoring Jesus Christ and I want to do it through prayer so let's pray to our Heavenly Father Almighty God the maker of heaven and earth the creator of us Lord Jesus thank you for this moment and the privilege we have to stand in your presence I realize today's topic may feel different it may seem distant it's highly misunderstood and yet, God, you created us, not by accident, but on purpose. The way that we're standing right now, God, you seek our innermost being right now. In Jesus' name, you see what's going on in our life. Those closed doors that we're keeping from you, God, you are welcome there. The thoughts that we think we're keeping from you, you already know them. So, God, I pray for students right now and even faculty, team, staff. In Jesus' name, if we're carrying anything into this place, stress, overwhelm, sadness, God, that you begin just to heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, lead us, guide us, empower us. Give us a peace now in Jesus' name that passes all understanding. God, I don't want to miss this moment. Honor our students. Thank you for the call that you've put on their life. God, we all are on this journey. We've all got spaces and places to go, ways that you have called us, some ways we won't even know for 20, 30, 40 years. God, would you just walk with them, encourage them, guide them, even today in Jesus' name. So thankful for our Chancellor PC, Pastor Lane, his kind words earlier, and just empower them, encourage them today in all the ministry that they've called. God, we love Michael Hodges. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for him loving us and encouraging us. We're so thankful for Pastor President Mark, Pastor Jill, and just her constant encouragement, how she loves on charity in me. It's such a special place for both of our lives. Thank you for my direct report, Dr. Matthew Benson, academic dean, all the work that he does behind the scenes to make us a college. God, would you bless his strength, encourage him, energize him, and his wonderful wife, Stacy, that you would just encourage her. God, empower her. God, I thank you for our friends that are with us today, Dr. Roland Brown and Chris Beck, and how they've poured into our lives today, and how they've encouraged us. I pray for my team. So thankful for Alex Blasco and Benji Swafford, and bless them today in their walk. God, I just give you this moment in Jesus' name. Charity, pray for Almighty God, I am grateful for our truly fearless leader in student development, General Ed Casey, GC. God, I'm grateful for his leadership. God, I'm grateful for who he is, the man that he is, and how he leads us. Father God, I'm grateful as well for the teammates that I get to work alongside. Ms. Anna Gilliland, Father God, who loves these students, who creates a wonderful team, who's encouraging, God, who makes us laugh. Father God, I'm grateful for her leadership. God, I'm grateful as well for the unsung heroes, superheroes in the student success department. They go by the, the Taylors, Taylor Hendricks and Taylor Etheridge. God, they love these students. They meet with them. They encourage. They um, just try to do their best to, to adapt and, and to work alongside them in the best ways that they can. God, I'm so grateful for this team, for the ones that are, that are up front, guys, and the ones that's, that are behind the scenes. We encourage them. We love them today. We are grateful. God, we honor them today. God, we are grateful for who you are and how you've created us. God, help us as we have this conversation today to bring glory and honor to your name. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you all so much.
You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank now today's so a Mawson awesome topic, charity. So get us started. This is an exciting time for us. Yes, This is absolutely. like a dream we've had. It is. Is to be able to teach this topic. So y'all are fulfilling a dream of ours that uh, we have dreamed and prayed for for decades, y'all. Decades. Yes, so truly. it's an honor. So charity, get us started today. Well, I want to start in the beginning because that is where God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, God knew us. He knew every aspect of our being. He knew us um, before we were born. And so it's an amazing thing to think about how God knows all the aspects of us. Um, and so today's topic, like we said, we're going to be talking about mental and emotional health. But I know that can be kind of a scary label. Um, and so we would actually like to call this conversation instead cheetahs and avocados. Okay. <laughs> I know you're already wondering what in the world is that, but trust me, we will get there. Um, but if you're more like me, you're going to want to really listen to the cheetah conversation. And if you're more like Mike, you're going to want to listen to the avocado conversation. And I've got the socks really on. Yeah, he does. It has avocados on them. I don't know. Yes, he's got avocado socks on. So just in case, thank you. Just in case Pastor Jill wondered if I had my cheetah socks on. I don't, I don't have cheetah socks, so I will have to, to work on that. Coming soon, coming soon to a foot near you. All right, so, um, <laughs> all right, that was funny. In the good store next week, <laughs> cheetah and avocado sauce. All right, That's awesome. Uh, but today we're going to try to give an overview of these topics because, like I said, I know this can be a conversation that may be, you know, frightening to you. It may feel like kind of foreign. You may be nervous about it. And so we just kind of want to give it some some easier handles, I guess. And so that's why we want to talk about cheetahs and avocados. Uh, but we also want to, to use some terminology for us that we've just found to be helpful. So we hope that you find this the same way. Because it is necessary for our Christian growth. And it is necessary for our, our activities in Christian ministry. Because even if you're not struggling, you're going to interact that day with somebody who is. And so you want to have the most tools available to you to be able to have this conversation in a, in a positive and encouraging type way. And so that's what we hope to, to accomplish with this um, conversation. So That's awesome. So Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. And I don't want us to enter this conversation without being reminded that it was God who created us in his image. So Genesis 1, 26. And then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, of the livestock, of the wild animals, over the creatures that move along the ground. And then it said, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And then said to them, and this is important, be fruitful and increase the number. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I want us to begin a conversation like this, reminding us that first and foremost, we are created in the image of God. Dr. Dwight Rice, one of our mentors, came up with what was called the symphonic view of personhood. And I'm going to explain it like this. So, who are my instrument players? Played through an instrument through high school or junior high. Could have been a guitar. Could have been a flute like Charity. I was on a snare drum for one year until they kicked me out. And so, so but the, the orchestra was made up of woodwinds and stringed instruments and brass and percussion. And the idea of a symphony, though, is that these orchestra parts would play all together. And a symphony is beautiful if they're all working together. And so if you think about it, let's make the woodwinds the Holy Spirit. The brass, our minds. Our percussion, our bodies. And our strings, our emotions. And imagine if all these parts of the orchestra are playing beautifully and made this symphonic view of personhood. They're all playing nicely together. And all of a sudden, Mike steps in on a snare drum and begins to play it. <laughs> and you begin to realize the symphony just isn't sounding quite right. The woodwind seems a little off. And all of a sudden, we begin to look at our body through a lens and realize something's, something's going on. I know I'm supposed to be physically healthy, spiritually healthy, mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, relationally healthy, and yet my symphony seems to be a little off. So something happened, right, Charity? So yes. So what, what happened? So a serpent and sin. <laughs> so Genesis 3, uh, we realize that this is where sin entered the picture. 
Um, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, um, and Satan tempted Adam and Eve and tried to encourage them and things to move away from what God had for them. And because of that, they began to be ashamed. And it teaches us in Genesis 3, 8 through 10, that God started seeking out Adam and Eve, and they were hiding from him. Why were they hiding? Because they were suddenly ashamed. They didn't want God to really know them. They didn't want God to really be able to see them. And so they decided, I need to conceal myself. I need to hide. And sometimes that's the, the way sin makes us feel. We want to hide from God. We want to remove ourselves, or we want to remove ourselves from community. We want to hide away. And so sometimes that's what the emotional and mental health struggles that we face make us want to do. We want to hide. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to bring it into the light. And so we want to, to, to move away from God. Um, I also, uh, when I was studying counseling, God really started um, kind of bringing to mind these verses as I was trying to wrap up my studies in counseling because I really wanted to understand how best to help people, how best to intercede because I knew I was going to be working with people who were struggling mentally and emotionally and so I wanted to kind of have a, a, a greater understanding of what that looked like. So God brought me to these verses in Genesis 3, 4 through 5. And it's talking when the, when the serpent is speaking to the woman trying to tempt her. And he said, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, talking about the tree, when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when God started bringing mind to these verses, I started realizing that this is also when mental illness entered the world. Because all of a sudden, it's like Satan is trying to tell us we're going to be like God. And from that point forward, we wanted to be like God. Our desire for control is because we want to be like God. I want to know who I'm going to marry, when this job is going to come my way. I want to know when that red light going out on 280 is going to turn green. Like, I want to know everything. I want to be like God. I want to be in control. And then all of a sudden, we realize that we're not. And what happens to us? Our anxiety increases. Because we realize, I am not in control. I can't make something happen. I can't always know everything. So that increases our stress. It increases the, the mental illnesses that we face. And all of a sudden, we're striving to be like God. We're striving to be in a place that we were never created to be in. We were created to be in his image, but we, were not, we are not God. We were never meant to be God. And so all of a sudden, we struggle with these things. And this affects our body, our mind, our emotions, our relationships with God, with others. And so all of a sudden, we, we face all of these different things. And so we realize that we have all sinned. And so what we like to say is, all, all God's, God's children, children got, got stuff. stuff. Okay? It's not good English, but it is good theology. So again, <laughs> all God's children got stuff. So look at your neighbor and tell them, you've got stuff. All right? Now look at your, look at your other choice and say, you've got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of stuff. All right? All right. All right. So we've all got stuff. All right. Everybody's got stuff. So <laughs> that's good. And then there's a but God. But God. But God. He didn't want you to stay in your stuff. So that also means that if you're busy making stuff your excuse, mm. and everybody's got to deal with your stuff, mm -hmm. there's an issue, right? And so if I've got a mental health stuff, we all do. We all have emotional health stuff. We have physical health stuff. We have spiritual health stuff. And then I look around and say, y'all deal with it. Hmm. Instead of seeking redemption, forgiveness, hope, and healing, and owning my own stuff, and the grace and loving hand of Jesus, so that I can impact others. John 10.10, 10, the thief, Jesus said, came to steal and to kill and to destroy He's in that process now, if, he can, if you let it. Stealing, killing, destroying. Christ said, 
I have come so that you may have life and just a little bit of it. Oh, life to the cup runneth over, big cup, huge cup, one I can't even hold, beyond measure, filled up, running over. And I think most of us live a life with a little bitty cup with nothing in it. And when we have this conversation, maybe one of the checks that you can do in your small group is how big is your cup and is it overflowing? Do I feel like I'm living this abundant life that Jesus himself promised? Or do I feel like I'm siding with the enemy? And where am I on this walk as we think about this journey with God? So, Charity, today, cheetahs, (laughs) avocados, where are we going with all this? All right, so I know you're interested What in the world does a cheetah have to do with this story, okay? Well, let's talk about emotional health. So the components of emotional health. Now, I know you're familiar with emotional intelligence because I know you speak about that in your classes. So again, just in case you've forgotten, I know you didn't, okay? But just in case you're wondering, um, emotional intelligence means you're aware of your own emotions and you respond to them in healthy ways. And you're also aware of other people's emotions and you respond to them in healthy ways. Our pastor, PC, has actually done a podcast on this if you need some refreshing on that. So just uh, listen to that and and gain some some insight with that one. Um, But also, PC reminds us when we're we're dealing with others um, and responding to their emotions that we can respond to their emotions in life-giving ways. So when somebody's struggling with, with some anger or some frustration, make sure that you are able to have life-giving ways to help them. Um, Emotional intelligence um, also was described by Robert Zapolsky. I was very nervous that I was going to get that name wrong. I may have got it wrong. Okay, so Robert (laughs) Zapolsky, it was making me nervous as I kept looking at it coming up here in my notes. Uh, The title of his book is Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Okay? Why zebras don't get ulcers? Apparently, it's not a light reading, so don't necessarily put it on your book list. But anyway, um, so we, uh, looking at this book, though, he talks about how, let's imagine we've got zebras grazing out there on the African plains, okay? So the zebras are grazing, and all of a sudden, they get that feeling there's a predator, all right? The next thing you know, they realize, cheetah! Okay, and so they start running, 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 and they're running away from him, and then they look around and they realize he's not there anymore, and guess what they do? They go back to grazing. So many of us live life like there is a cheetah behind every single bush. We live life like we are stressed out, like we cannot slow down, like we are heightened emotions all of the time. And For some of us, to be honest, the reason is because maybe we grew up in an environment where there was a lot of cheetahs, okay? I'm not going to deny that because I've walked with people throughout my ministry who had a lot of cheetahs growing up, okay? But at the same time, we want to encourage you, if you feel like there is truly a cheetah around every bush, there is help and hope for you in Jesus Christ There's also help and hope for you and and people who want to invest in you and who want to encourage you and help you come down from feeling like there's a cheetah around every corner, okay? But for many of us, we function like we're on high alert all of the time anyway. We, We function like there's always a predator out there. Our emotions are always ready to just pop off. So if somebody you know, cuts us off in traffic, the next thing you know, we're, we're frustrated, we're screaming at them, or we come home tired, and we interact with somebody that we love, and, and the next thing you know, we're not, we're not giving life, life-giving life words to them like PC encourages, we're giving them hurtful words. We want to learn how to respond rather than react, okay? That's something that we all need to be able to do. Sometimes, though, when we're experiencing um, too many emotions in our anger, we sin, right? That's what it teaches us in Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. It doesn't say that we're not going to get angry. It doesn't say that we're not going to have these emotions. It says, do not sin. So regardless of what your emotion is, whether it's disappointment, whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, it's all about your response. How do I respond in these moments? How am I moving forward in obedience? Okay? There's also some of us who, instead of running whenever we see a cheetah, we bottle it up. 
we don't want to express emotions because maybe we were taught emotions are not something that we need to share with others. And so instead, we start shoving it down. So let's just imagine, for example, that I have a Coke can in my hand right now. All right? And I start talking about all the things that are stressing me out, and I'm shaking up this Coke can. And then I hand it to someone right here. Is anybody going to want to open my Coke can? And why not? It's going to explode, right? It's going to go everywhere. It's the same thing that happens to us when we bottle up our emotions. If we don't pour them out in healthy ways, they are going to come out somewhere. Whether they come out in an explosion of anger, whether they come out in ulcers, we do get ulcers. Zebras don't, but we do. It may come out in an ulcer, a headache. We may um, be depressed. We may cry. Your emotions are going to go somewhere. And so it's important to understand how to process these emotions and respond in healthy ways. Another part of um, our emotional health, uh, Mike is going to actually give us a quick brain illustration because sometimes we may think that our emotions and our thoughts are too, so tied together because you may not even realize there's a difference between emotional health and mental health. And so we want to give you this quick illustration so that you can see they're actually coming from do, two different parts of your brain. So Yeah, Mike's this is good. So I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't want to offend my <laughs> medical people, but I am want to show you a simple illustration. So if you get your arm out, just hold one arm up. And I want you to kind of crook your wrist just like this. All right. So my arm is my spinal cord going up to my brain stem. Now your brain stem has all your auto automatic functions like my heart rate, my blood pressure, my pupil size, digestion, adrenaline response. All those things happen in my brain stem. Now I want you to put your thumb into your hand just like that. That's the emotional center of your brain that sits right next to all those automatic functions. So when you have an emotion, your body responds. Anger, body responds. Sadness, body responds. Happiness, body responds. You got it? Now I want you to fold your hand over your thumb. Keep your, this is your, you know, your brain, your spinal cord, brain stem, <laughs> emotional center, prefrontal cortex. You get to think about your emotions. The problem is when we react, you're just using your thumb to your brainstem and your body goes. Without inviting the prefrontal cortex, your thinking part of your brain, to actually respond in healthy ways to the emotional reaction. Journey. So another part of our emotional health is realizing what we're feeling. Like, what are our emotions? Am I at peace? Am I like we talked about, am I being reactive or am I being responsive? But also we're acknowledging all of the emotions because for some of us, some emotions feel safer than others. For some of us, we can do sadness. Some of us can do happiness. Some of us can do anger, but not happiness. And so some of our emotions may not feel so safe. And so when you're in an emotionally healthy place, you can recognize all of your emotions and acknowledge all of the emotions, and then respond out of them in healthy ways. That is so good. Y'all absorbing all this okay? All right, so mental health, just briefly. Now, I like to exercise, and I have a tendency to sprain my ankle quite a bit. Charity will Amen. tell me that a dust bunny with attitude, if I step on it, I Amen. can sprain my ankle. It's Amen. just that simple. Not bad. And the problem is when I sprain your ankle, what happens to you? You start to... Limp. Now, I've got to own this. But Charity has never come to me and go, now, Mike, stop limping. <laughs> Just stop. you got to walk normal. And I'm like, but my ankles. No, no, no. No, you, you got to fix that. <laughs> and I think when we get to the conversation of mo mental health, like we're just running along that half marathon that you're training for, and you don't, yeah. and you step as I rise. Amen. Yeah, right. amen. And so you're running along in that half marathon, <laughs> and then you sprain your ankle. I think I've got to own my sprained ankle. Like, you won't see Charity carrying me across the lawn to the building here. No. She's going to say, Mike, you're just going to have to walk. You may be limping, but you've got to walk. In mental health, some of us have a limp. And when you're ministering in the context of mental health, you might want to say, just straighten that up. Mm -hmm. You can walk normal. And the problem is they've got this limp, and they're like, but I've got to heal. But then the other issue is, if I am struggling with mental health, the tendency is carry me across the lawn, will you? Instead of saying, no, I've actually got responsibility on mental health. Just like I have responsibility for my physical health, no one can run the half marathon for you. 
You're going to have to step up to the starting line, and you're going to have to start the journey. So when we get to mental health, the idea of avocado comes up. So Alan Lindell was my pastoral counselor, and he said, how many gears do you have, Mike? And I said, all of them, like drive, reverse, neutral. He's like, I don't think so. I think you got one gear, and it's called overdrive. And you have your foot on the gas all the time. He says, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to put an avocado seed on this little jar with two picks in it. And we're, every time you come into my office, I want you to yell at the avocado seed and go, Grow! Come on, avocado! You got it! Just grow! And then we're going to sit down and have our time. Next office, sure enough, he has an <laughs> avocado seat in there. I'm looking at him. He's like, go ahead. Grow! You can see me. Go on, baby. Grow! No, keep going. Keep yelling at it. Grow! And then we sit down and do it again. He sent me a picture yesterday. Michael is the avocado that he named. <laughs> I kid you not. So it's been over seven years now ish, and it's five feet tall. Michael's gonna take about another five years to bear fruit. And it all started with me yelling at a seed in his office <laughs> because I wasn't content on what is. I always wanted to be content in what could be. And a lot of what mental health is, is me yelling at an avocado instead of just going, you know, it's a seed, it is what it is. God, you're not surprised where I am. I have plans for the future, but you're not, you're not surprised. And how can my mind be content in the present moment? Instead of trying to rush ahead and forcing little Michael and the avocado seed to grow up to be just five feet now, instead of being anxious still about what he could be, my mind isn't flourishing i still got this limp, you see. And I'm still trying to yell at an avocado if I'm not content about. God knows where we are, y'all. He knows the issues you're facing. He knows the struggle we're having. But when we start working through our emotions, our cheetahs, and now we're sitting here busy yelling at an avocado, we can begin to see how this spins up. So you came up with a quick story about feel, think, do. Feeling, emotional health, thinking, mental health, and now behavior. So talk us through that. <laughs> yes, we're gesturing to our friend Roland because he knows where this story is going. <laughs> um, so um, several years ago, uh, Mike and I were serving alongside Roland Brown over there at a church, and Mike and Roland were working on some project. I can't even remember to this point what it was, but they were working on a project together, and Mike was like, we are just not communicating well, and I don't know what the problem is. He said, I, I love him like a brother. We both love Jesus, but we are just not getting it. Like we, we are not clicking for some reason. Can you come and sit with us and coach us through this so we can figure out what's going on? I was like, sure, of course. So I go in, and I sit down, and I, they start talking, and I have been married to my husband now. It'll be 25 years this summer. Whoop, whoop. All right. I married up, y'all. Yes. I married up. That's it. <laughs> so at that point, we have been married for 20 years. Okay? So I'm sitting there watching the two of them talk to each other, and I'm hearing my husband say questions like, how does that make sense? Or does that make sense? Okay? So he's going logical. He's going to his brain, all right? Then my friend Roland over here is going, how does that feel? I feel that. And they're both talking to each other, and they're trying to understand each other, love each other, but they're, like, not getting it. Like, they're not hearing each other in that same way. And all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went off, and I was like, how did I not see this before? My husband is a think-first Processor. I know for any of you who've interacted with him, you're like, she's just now figuring that out. But I really did. Like for me, it was like, how is that possible? Because I guess I always thought people processed the same way I did, which is through feelings first. That is not how my husband goes to his decision-making process first. He immediately goes to his brain. Roland goes to his heart. They were not able to have that good conversation because they weren't able to really understand each other. And so we started talking through this, this process that we call it, the feel, think, do process. We call it your train. And so we started talking through how each of us make decisions. And it began to be something that for us just really opened up the conversation even better. I actually found a John Maxwell quote uh, just this week that just really like uh, helped me out. His quote was, the mind cannot embrace what your heart cannot explain. 
So for me, what that means is that if my heart doesn't really get it, then I'm not going to, to connect with it logically. My brain's not going to get it, and I'm not going to be able to move forward. All of the parts of you, the feelings, the thinking, and then the behaviors, all have to work together. God created all of it. He didn't just create you to be a doing being. He created you to be a feeling being, a thinking being, a relational being, all of this. And so all of this has to work together in a synergy, in a symphony, in order to be able to be the best that you can be for God. Yeah, I love this. So you can think about how Christ is now working in and through us. And imagine not growing and feeling and thinking and relationships. And now I'm trying to relate to my brother Roland over there. And we're not working on our stuff. Imagine how our communication goes now. And now think of ministry. And I'm not pursuing health and ministry. And I'm dealing with a very, very broken world. That doesn't have the answer that you have. In the gospel of Christ. The power, his transformational power of his Holy Spirit. You don't. They don't. And if you decide not to work on your stuff. And you're trying to communicate the feel, think, and do. Imagine the chaos we're all going to have in relationships. In leadership. Internally with our emotions and our minds. So to make it personal, right before small group charity, share your story a little bit about what this looks like in you. So I realized after watching the two of them that I am a feel, think, do processor. Now I know you may be thinking, well, that sounds like the, the best one maybe because you feel it, you think about it, you do it. it. It's not that easy for me, okay? And it's not that easy for you either probably. But for me, I get into what I call my feel, think, tornado, all right, I feel it immediately. When I'm, when I'm sitting with somebody, I am emotionally connected. I'm hearing your story. My emotions are in there. They're in the room. I can't help it. I watch a movie. It's the same way. I immediately feel it, okay? Then I start thinking maybe a logical plan. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to respond? And I start spinning, okay? And I'm in this feel-think tornado. So for me, the last part of my train is what I call it. The last part of my train, the do, is the hardest one for me. Because I'm so caught up in my feelings and my thoughts that it is hard for me to get out of that tornado and actually do something. All right? So for me, I know that's the most difficult part. I think for most people, the, the last part of your train, whatever you decide that is, and I'm not going to decide it for you because you may be a feel, think, do person. You may be a think, feel, do person. A feel, do, think and I think, do, feel. I think I got them all. <laughs> but whatever one for you, you want to skip over, that's probably your hardest one. For me, it is actually the doing. And I also know that for some of you, you have been working on this maybe, and you're going to continue to work on this, and it's still going to be a struggle. And that's where I want to encourage you. For some of you, there's some stuff in your backstory that makes this really hard. And I want to encourage you that there, there is help out there, and if you need that help, don't be afraid to get it, whatever that means for you. If that means professional counseling, if that means pastoral counseling, if that means medication, don't be afraid to use the tools that God has given us to help us out. Yeah, so just real briefly, before we go to small group, my process is think, do, and you got to wait about six days. <laughs> Feel. <laughs> I mean, let's just be real. I'm think, do, and then you got to wait. It took me forever. I began to weep with Charity when I realized I wasn't even processing how she was experiencing life. Phil wasn't on the table. I'd look at her less than early in our marriage because you're just not doing enough stuff. I'm strategically planning all this stuff out. We're getting a lot of stuff done. Catch up. And I wasn't even connecting to my wife because I wasn't living the life that she had, we had been called together to experience life the way she was already experiencing it. So in my work, there's great strength in think and do. Great strength. I can go into a crisis. I can go into an emergency. I can make a lot of plans. I'm a systems kind of guy, and we can get it done. But at the end of every single day, I'll pause and go, now what did I feel today? Because if I don't deal with my emotions, they're going to deal with me. And so I must face my emotions and bite them to the table, put them in the loving hands of Christ, and say, teach me what my emotions are showing me. I have to process them through a logical order. And then respond to them in healthy ways so I can grow and connect more closely to the one person I have to be good at, my wife, Charity. 
think, do, feel. She's a feel, think, do. And I think that's going to set us up well for our small groups, Judy. And in your small group time today, um, your small group leaders, we met with them a little earlier and encouraged them in some ways to kind of to help you out. But through your small group times, if you realize, man, I would like to know more or there's some stuff that I feel like I'm, I'm getting stuck in, Mike and I are actually going to stay here in the auditorium for a few minutes. But also, you're welcome to come and connect with us, to, to have meetings, to kind of explore this more, to understand better how you're created. Because you were created by God. He created you in his image, and he knows the things that you've been through. He knows how you process life. So don't look at yourself and say, I wish I was somebody else, okay? I wish I was something else. I wish I did this differently. He created you in a special way to connect with people, to be able to do things the way that he wants you to do them. So don't feel yourself less than. Encourage yourself in that today that God has created you in his image. We are grateful for this time that we've had. I think Miss Liz is going to come up at this point and kind of transition us to small groups. Come on, Highlands College. Can we honor Dr. Mike and Charity? Come on, you can do a little bit better than that. Can we honor them today? You know, I'm so thankful, Dr. Mike and Charity, and I think, and you guys can take a seat for just real, real quick, and then we're going to dismiss you guys. Don't want your legs to get tired. But I just want to take a second and honor both of you and thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like for so many of us that the light just came on. Of being, under, be, uh, being able to understand something that culture normalizes but doesn't give a lot of context for. And the enemy is so, um, so in, instinctive in that he always, does, he always works through deception. And if we can't understand the battle that we're facing, then we're going to be confused on how to fight it. And so I'm just so thankful for both of you because I feel like you just brought so much understanding, so much clarity today. So one more time, can we just honor them for their time, for their investment, for the way they love and care for us? And I am so excited. We're getting ready to, again, just as they mentioned, to break up into small groups and dive a little bit deeper into this topic. But here's what I want you to know as we go in to groups. This is not a counseling session. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think any of us are qualified to counsel each other, all right? We're all somewhere on this journey, so we're not, it's not a counseling session, it's not a pastoring session. We are just peers on the journey trying to get a better understanding of this fight that we're in, okay? And so the one that we have victory over, and so as we go and we get ready to discuss, be open, be honest, share what you've learned, share what you're learning about yourself, so that way we can all grow together. Sound good? Okay, awesome. Well, as we get ready to dismiss, leaders have your, you have the questions sent to you. Um, if you guys need anything, let us know. Your leader has the location that you guys are going to be meeting in. And if for some reason you have not heard from your leader, we're going to be in our same groups from Saturate. But if you haven't heard from your leader, come find me up front and I'll be happy to help get you connected to a group. And then let's all go straight to our group. I know Dr. Charity and Dr. Mike, they're going to be available in here, but I want us all to go to our group first, start, get this conversation going, and then if needed, you can come back in here and connect with them. Sound good? All right, awesome. Well, HC, go ahead, break into your groups, and then we'll go straight to lunch from there. Have a great day.